involved in uh, a seven-year PCK project uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. And so our thinking started with the Magnuson model. And so we still, with slight variations, still draw on this model and thinking about orientations as being a filter uh, to the other components of PCK. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time about on this, but just to give you a context, so it has been a longitudinal study that we're involved in, and it's a qualitative study. Uh, the context is a post-bac teacher ed program, and uh, ours, that lasts 15 months. And so we collect data when students enter that program, and then we follow them sometimes three years beyond that program. And part of that data set, we have some teachers who are teaching the same lesson of one year to the next, maybe in a different school, maybe in the same school. And our interest has really been in trying to understand PCK development. And so that's why we took a qualitative approach. We wanted to say, find out what are they learning at different points in time. And uh, then we've also looked at experienced teachers, uh, 15 plus years, and we think about that as an in target. What's a, a practical goal that we might be able to reach? So as I'm speaking, you kind of get a context of where I'm coming from. And so I'm just gonna do a, a little brief summary of what we've learned. Uh, science teaching orientations started out being something in the Magnuson chapter for me that was fuzzy and didn't quite sit right, and it remains that way today. Uh, and, I, and I've learned a few things, but it, there's, it's still very messy for me. And so some of the things that I've learned, I think of them as really complex set of beliefs. And uh, we've learned in our pre-service teachers that those are pretty resistant to change. They're very robust. It's based on their K-12 teaching, K-16 learning experiences. And we don't see a lot of shift um, in our teachers over initially beginning teachers. But we found that those orientations really shape what they learn in our courses and what they learn when they're out in the field. And so I've come to understand them as being really critical, but very messy. And so some people have, have had other findings, but um, we have found that what they tell us, their spouse beliefs are, they align pretty closely to what we see. And I think that's because we're out there and they know us so well and they get busy and they forget to put on a front for us. And so they tell us and they do what they normally would do. So we've seen a pretty close alignment of that, uh, especially in our experienced teachers, uh, but, but also in our beginning teachers. But for us, the beliefs part, even though I would like to ignore the beliefs part, it has helped us understand these interactions. And I've had doc students who say, okay, I'm gonna only look at learners and assessment, but then when we look over time, we can't explain what's happening until we go back to what their beliefs are and if their beliefs have changed and how those beliefs have, have filtered for them. So as an example of that, um, our beginning teachers, I'm sure similar to yours, learn that students don't learn what they think they're learning, what they're teaching them. And so they find out that students really struggle. And so then we found that our beginning teachers add practice. Uh, in some cases that practice is, after, I'm, after I've taught the lesson, turn to your partner and repeat what I've said. And so how does that learning about student difficulty translate to adding opportunities to practice what the teacher has said? And so when we go back and we look at orientations, their views are very much trans transmission. Teaching is telling, learning is listening. So you must need more practice repeating what I'm saying. And so for us, we always have had to go back to understanding what their beliefs are, to understand <coughs> why they're learning what they're doing and what their practice is. And so for us, looking at this beliefs piece, um, and we've sliced it in lots of different sections, and we've tried to make it simple, and we've tried to make it really complicated and have lots of different sub-dimensions to it, but for us, it's an important piece to understand development and to understand practice, why they're doing what they're doing. If I just want to know what they know, I don't think I care about beliefs. If I'm trying to understand how their learning develops over time, then it becomes important. <laughs> and so I wanted to speak briefly about the nine categories, I'm sorry, Joe, 
the nine categories um, of Magnuson's um, Krejcik and Borko's nine categories. And do you know the nine categories I'm referring to? Inquiry and project. So I'm going to draw on some work that Jan and I did together. And so we don't know what the author's intent was. Uh, the author's intent, was it to illustrate some different teaching uh, approaches? Or was it, here are the, all the possibilities? And re irregardless of what their intent was, for some researchers that actually became the list and uh, that they chose from. And so you'll see in the literature where people will identify teachers with this label and then they'll acknowledge that they, they actually also had this and this and this, but I decided to pick the one out of the four. And so some of the issues when we went back and really looked at the literature, there's not strong empirical grounding on, on many of those categories. In some cases, it might be a single case study of an elementary teacher for one of the orientations. And sometimes the studies aren't about the teachers, but they're about a curriculum project that was being implemented. And so, for me, that list is a real mix, and there's even different definitions of orientations in that. Is it teaching approaches? Is it purposes? Uh, and so, that, that chapter has, has added to some of the confusion, I think. So, when Jan and I went back and reviewed PCK papers that had used the Magnuson model, these were the four issues that we identified. And the first issue that I'm writing to you um, from this paper is that people are using orientations in very different ways, or they're using them and they're not defining how they're using them. And also, they're not, they'll say, this person had a didactic orientation, and then they'll talk about the other PCK components, but they don't connect the two and say, well, how did that inform? How did that shape? Um, and then this issue of just assigning teachers to a category. Uh, and I think one result that we've seen is because it's so messy, we see people just trying to ignore the entire thing. And so it's like, okay, I'm just going to talk about instructional strategies and, or just assessment. And, and I think that's a logical solution to the problem, that it's so messy, how do I deal with it? So I'm not going to deal with it. And um, so... We looked at what people have said are sets of beliefs that do seem to affect practice. And so beliefs about the goals and purposes, uh, beliefs about the nature of science, and beliefs about um, the role of the teacher and what learning is are the set that, that Jan and I have proposed. Even these dimensions, like the good instruments for assessing their nature of science knowledge, I don't find BNOS that helpful. And so, how, how are you going to assess that? So in closing, I wanted to identify some steps. I think it would be helpful if we had some consensus. Um, we didn't get consensus in our group on what is content knowledge <laughs> and what is PCK. I think, so I'm going to throw this question on the table. It would be helpful if we had some consensus on what are science teaching orientations. Are they approaches? Are they core beliefs? What core beliefs are they? I think there's a really complex set of core beliefs, but which ones do we really have to pay attention to and really matter? I think that's a more practical question. Um, and then I, I think we have to identify, well, what beliefs seem to make a difference? And so, and recently, we've been putting teachers not into nine categories, but into two categories. And those are, are they transmission um, mode, or in the more constructivist based, and that simple label seems to help explain some differences for us. So, what differences really help explain the practice that you're seeing? Uh, not necessarily what are all the different beliefs, but which are the critical ones. I think that would move the field forward. And uh, is it a continuum that people move across? Do you start out transmissionist and move? Uh, on a normal progression. And I also think that we need instruments that help do this. And I, I've seen some instruments, and sometimes they're too simplistic, but finding that right level of getting what you need to help explain the differences, I think we're still struggling with that. And then I think we have to do some work in those areas and bring some consensus in those areas before we can really explore the relationships between the components. So, and so in summary, I would say it's still, after thinking about this for 10 years, it's really messy for me.